This is back on again, by the way. Well, so, quiz question for today. I asked it from my last class just today, and I thought, well, that's, gonna, that's a good quiz question for both. And that is, um, do you think Facebook, we, we were watching uh, Mark Zuckerberg answering some of the senators. And what happened with that? I, I don't, why is he in trouble? Um, the battle is going, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, because uh, basically he got caught selling everybody's data. Oh. And hmm. the ways they obtain that data are kind of in a gray area. Are they like selling people's information? Pretty much, yeah. Everything oh. you do. Awesome. Including this conversation. Uh. Yeah, this is on the web. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one one interpretation of it. I mean, you know, the other th the thing that he's pointed out is that the only things that could be shared are things that you voluntarily put on there. Put on there. Yeah. Um, although, so like, say if you were a friend of mine, and an app offered me to do something, mm -hmm. and I like, oh, okay, I'll do that. And one of the things it does is it looks through all of my information that's on Facebook, one of the things of which is that you are a Facebook friend of mine mm -hmm. with your Facebook information. Oh, I see. Even if you haven't shared your information with that app no. yourself, I just did. Also, gotcha. I think Frank? the problem so, is that a lot of people don't realize the interconnectivity of, of yeah, everything. Yeah, how much was being given out with, you know, without their explicit I've, consent, you know. Yeah, I've, I've seen some things about it, but I didn't ever, like, read it. But I know that he had to go and testify. Testify, yeah. Well, there's also the thing that they can, like, I don't know if this has happened to you, where, like, you'll you'll talk about something, you know, oh, for a while, yeah, and I then all of a sudden <laughs> it pops up and ads on Facebook. Nice. Um, call out, like, that was sh papas. somebody shared that you know, and I, I saw the mom is in the papa's post, and I, th I said, you know, ha ha. Are are people arguing with like that if you put your profile on private that they shouldn't be able to take it? Because you know how you can have your you can have your profile public. I haven't even explored it because I, I obviously share. I, I mean, there are, are, are levels of decency. I mean, I, you know, I yeah. always doesn't matter. Always yeah. laugh at people that are on like cell phone conversations while they're in the bathroom. <laughs> Things of that sort. My my phone is not a smartphone, so I'm That's kind good. of safe from some of the issues that some people are. But but it was clearly the case that senators don't even know how the system works. Oh yeah. But the way they were asking the questions. It was hilarious. His face is like, yeah. they didn't know how can you, about. how can you even think that? That's not an issue. He doesn't say any of that. You can tell his, if you're watching his face, his face is, how do I answer their dumb question, you know, without being impolite? Because yeah. these are senators. You know, you don't insult a senator. I don't think he's terrible. Well, I don't know. He's I, a I mean, maybe, just, maybe just physically by being on the spot. I don't think he's actually worried about the situation. But I think maybe just. Right down but there. you could tell he's clearly thinking through what kind of answer he should give. Oh, so like, like the one in senator general, was general. trying to get him to admit that we're much better off in this country because we have yeah. things like Facebook. And he's connected a lot of his customers, Facebook members, yeah. are people in China or other places. So he's not ready to just go the nationalist kind of yeah. jargon that the yeah. senator was trying to get him to say. It's two billion um, members and we're three hundred twenty yeah. in the country, so Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So 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 he's he's thinking clearly, yeah. he's answering in a way that he's not going to offend his Facebook membership. Yeah. He's gonna be honest. Is there a threat that he could go to jail right no. now? No. Oh okay. Oh no. I have deleted like all social media off my phone so I'm that's probably smart, though. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been really refreshing. I'm the opposite, but that's because I have no I'm a huge cynic, and I don't, I don't trust the government, so I don't like them 
being able to have my access to my I, st I still get paid by the government every, yeah. every month. Well, so. I get paid by the government to go to be sitting in this class, so right, there's that, right. you know, there's yeah, that I, irony. I needed a break. I didn't need to see everyone else's lives and yeah. what they were doing. But other than that, oh, it's so yeah, it's amazing what people will post, you know, what meals they're having. I do that too. Yeah, I, um, uh. I'm so used to having it on my phone, like, you know, I realized how much I'm really consumed in it, because if I have a free second, I'm picking up my phone to go on Instagram or to go on Facebook, and I'm like, wow, like, I'm truly addicted. Yeah. Because I'll pick it up, and I don't have anything on there anymore, so I'm like, what do I do? Like, yeah. what, what can I possibly do in oh. this moment other than be on Facebook or be on Instagram? I just wrote a, a seven-page essay about this for my writing class. Really? We're talking yeah. about technology addiction and how like prevalent it is and how cool. to stop it and how people are like doing a turnaround instead of like advancing on technology. They're trying to like advance on interpersonal relationships outside of yeah, that. Yeah, so. definitely. I just I realize like how if I have a free moment, I'm on there at yeah. night. You don't I think have about a, it. No, yeah, and I have like a routine when I lay yeah. down. Like I go on Facebook, I go on Instagram. I read BuzzFeed and then I like look at iFunny or something. And it's, it's almost like a nicotine addiction. It is, yeah. It's because it's, it's so stimulating, you know. It's like I could go practice my guitar or I could like go outside. Yeah. 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 Do anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Think, be introspective for a moment. I yeah. went outside and I went on like a two hour hike today and it like felt so good. I love being outside. But the, the movie we saw last Tuesday, not this Tuesday, but the one before that was Ready Player One. Oh, yeah. And you know, the scientist is, you know, like the, the main moral theme that he presents is, remember, the only thing that's real is reality. <laughs> Which, you know, prompted my question about, well, what about virtual reality? Isn't that real? You know, so thinking about David Chalmers and his argument, you know, we've, this is a real experience that you're having on virtual reality. So it's, you know, we're learning the language. You know, what, what do we call this experience? Well, his answer is it's digital, digitally real. Yeah. So it is real, it's, but it's, and it's, it's very obviously you're seeing these images through the lenses of a device. They were made, uh, like that one video, I have no idea how they did that because there's no way that they could have uh, had a video of the Roman period in Köln or the yeah. middle, middle middle altar uh, period in you know Köln. You know, uh, you know. I even the right after the World War II. I'm pretty sure no. Uh, some some shenanigans happened uh, in developing that 360 video in color for all those ages, you know, um, uh, uh, it's, it was created. Uh, impressive. What video was um, it? I just showed it. Uh, is the color not on? Uh, here. So this, this video. Okay. Um, have you been? Have I been there? No. no. Except virtual reality. Okay, where you been? Let's see. This is so. So this is like the modern day. Yeah, the Gucci store across the street. And now I'm going to go back to the destroyed building. Here's a soldier coming back. This is right after the end of the war. Still is unheimlich. Ich erkenne meine Stadt kaum wieder. Look how realistic this looks. Alles nur noch Trümmer. This is really well made. Aber mitten drin, der Dom. Angekratzt zwar und voller Narben, aber er steht noch. Fast wie ein Wunder. Well, they purposely did bomb it. They used it as a... But now watch, he's going to go back into the Middle Ages. There's no way any of this video could have actually been Right, you know, so this is the Middle Ages. So this is this is like a computer game, I guess. Yeah. How they designed those. Die Glocken läuten vom Südturm. And then zum ersten Mal. You know, after alles mein Werk. Na, die Türme sind leider nicht ganz fertig. Die müssen jetzt meine Nachfolger verwenden. 
where of course the cathedral's not there at all. No. It's tall building. So now you're in Rome. Well, it's in the same location supposedly, but obviously this is. So, I mean, I have a question. How, how do you make this? You know, he's walking around. Die wichtigsten Männer gehen bei mir ein und aus. Genau wie in Ruhe. Was mir aber gar nicht gefällt. So, that's kind of cool. I don't know how they did it. But is it real? Well, it obviously having an experience of something. So, Chalmers is suggestion for how we talk about it is to refer to it as digitally real. Because <laughs> it's a real image that I'm really looking at through the digital equipment right. that's presenting it. But it's obviously not real in the sense of, you know, knock on wood. Um, but it, it's ridiculous to say it's totally fake. Well, yeah, but yes, I can understand if what you mean by calling it fake is to say that it's fake because it's not real. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I get that. Well, what do we call it then? You know, it's a brand new experience. I mean, same thing with movies. You go to see a movie, yeah. that's totally fake. Like Dunkirk, you know, go see the movie Dunkirk, right? That's totally film today none of that's r real and yet at the uh, on the other hand they've got like the real planes the real ships the you know men dressed in the uniforms on the beach being blown up i don't know how much they had to pay their those poor actors families you know for their dead bodies i don't know how they do that you know i mean obviously they didn't really blow up people do you think that unless that's you know that's another case of people not reading the the the, the small print you know <laughs> do you think that the virtual reality like improves your life because i know you really like it oh absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean there's a real quandary over whether you want to actually go visit a place where you've got to spend the money for the transportation besides the hours of flying in an uncomfortable seat and with other people that are, you know, um, I, I mean, all that expense, etc. When, why are you going there in the first place to see it? I'd argue that though. You, you, know, you go for, for the feeling that it invokes too. You know, oh yeah, I mean, you know, standing inside. I understand is, is being in, amazing. like, the Tower of London, where. You see chop block. You know, you know, Anne was imprisoned, you know, in the room. You know, wow, this is the real room, et cetera. That's got to be different than, you know, standing there in my living room and looking at a virtual reality image of it. Yeah. You're only getting the one sense, you know, visually. You know, right, the right. right. Well, I'm sure the smell is different because yeah. the heating system <laughs> has changed, you know. You know. The input. Smells like stone. Yeah, you know, I I mean there's you know tons of. I'm going there. This I bet Anne smelled different. I, a young lady walked by me, said hello, and as she walked by, a waft or whatever you call it of the perfume. beautiful perfume that she wore, you know, goes by, and I'm thinking to myself, gee, should I do that to myself? No, <laughs> that's wrong. You know, etc. But what did Anne smell like? I bet it was phew. They didn't have. Herself, they know. didn't have modern. They wash the clothes more. However, but let me tie this in to what we're supposed to be talking about today, and that's Hannah Arendt. And that little article is her talking about the difference between eternity versus immortality. You might might think, gee, that's that's pretty obvious. 
eternity on the one hand uh, has al always been there in juxtaposition to secularity in the sense that secularity is the here and now and eternity is unchanging etern you know all time so when we go back and we think about uh, Plato and his conception of the ideal world the ideal world is real because it's eternally unchanging it's always the same always remains the same I know like in the prayers uh, that the Christian uh, church uses uh, in referring to the difference remember, remember the difference between uh, um, If you're familiar with it or not, this is in the Council of Nicaea, what, 325 AD? I guess it says. Obviously, this is the English version, and that would have been in Greek, etc. cetera. Uh, might even have been changed in translation depending on specifics. But to give you the idea, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So it's two two things that God made, heaven and earth. So heaven is eternal and earth is the physical changing material world, the cosmos, right? Of all things visible and invisible, the visible are the things I can see in the cosmos. The invisible are invisible because they're abstractions, triangularity. squareness you know you know you know whiteness uh, uh, purity I name any of those abstract concepts and you can't see them as they're referring to things that are in the ideal world of Plato that are eternal what's pure is eternally the case that purity is such you know un you know, you know, smeared with dirt or what, you know, whatever, right? You know, uh, um, we can apply it, of course, in specific cases, as President Trump always lived a pure and chaste life. No, right? Uh, we don't have, you know, so, uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure even he would agree to that. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have broached that subject. However, you get the idea. You know, the, we use these ideas. Remember, Plato's concept of them was: where do we get the idea of red beard? Well, I must know redness, and I know beardness, and I put those together in the context of how I'm experiencing this changing uh, reality of the cosmos at the moment, and I see this particular individual has a red beard. But where, how do I know it? Not because, well, he has a red beard. I know it because I know what redness is and beardness is, which is because my soul is connected to the ideas, which are unchanging. Redness is always redness forever, unchanging, even when there were no people. That's Plato, right? So the visible is the here and now. The invisible are the ideas. So that's again a reference to the heaven and the earth. The things in heaven are invisible. It's actually kind of why uh, a lot of contemporary Christians, the American version, which is really as, as new as kind of the great awakening or the, the, um, the burned over districts from New York or Pennsylvania where uh, relatively uneducated individuals reading the Bible interpreted it for themselves, ignoring over a thousand years of traditional interpretation, really the Christian uh, point of view, and created what we think of today as the literalist or fundamentalist point of view, 
which is basically idiotic. Uh, uh, it's not my fault. You can read all sorts of literature about exactly this. Uh, and you end up with people um, that think heaven is a place <laughs> where they can physically go once they're dead. <laughs> that maybe is up there somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you know, that's kind of buffoon-like, you know, to think of it that way. Uh, because, you know, no, this is Plato. Heaven is a return to the non-physical. And your soul is non-physical in that conception of metaphysics. Uh, that means that your soul is no longer stuck in this particular physical body and you've released, you've gone back to heaven. Not a place, because a place would be a physical place, which kind of sort of would need a physical body for you to go there, etc. Um, and we, we can, of course, get into Aquinas, where Aristotle was remerged with Christian belief in the late 1280s uh, uh, AD, uh, and basically the idea then that, well, but you're going to need your body in order to uh, uh, be re re resurrected because the soul was conceived of then as the activity of the body. So if you don't have a body that's active, there's no soul, right? So yes, the, the church then got into more complex arguments over, well, well, so is there a heaven that you're in a death or does it take the actual resurrection before you're back, so, et cetera? So yes, all that gets into the church thing. But in that case, the, the resurrection would have to be here because the place that your soul uh, as an active body could return to would have to be the physical place that exists, which is actually here. So that, that's where you get the conception of the earth having to be basically transformed into a, a city of God. Well, that's actually Augustine. But you know, a city of God would be a Christian world where everybody behaves according to Christian rules and gets along well, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, but we go back and we look at the creed here. This is, this is Plato. Right? So what did the church what, think of Plato? Um, Augustine is a Platonist, or more specifically a Neo-Platonist, uh, and Plotinus is kind of the main influence on Augustine, and Plotinus gives you a version of Platonism which is uh, based on kind of an emanation theory, It kind of connects heaven and earth in a more physical way. Um, Kind of interesting. Yeah, Aquinas, was, was Aquinas is influenced by Aristotle, but also by church dogma. So, so Augustine's philosophy, his dogma is entrenched. It's Christian. And by the way, Aquinas's impact on it by ver merging it with Aristotle, I would argue, precipitates a lot of why the Protestant Reformation took place. Because a lot of those reformers wanted to stick to the original Augustinian point of view, did not want to accept Aquinas's, you know, merger with Aristotle, which, by the way, brought in science, which resulted in the science uh, revolution, the scientific revolution, which is a revolution against. Aristotle's science, so yeah. So, so you've you, you got you so got much. yeah. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. I love it. Yeah. Fascinating way to spend your time studying all this stuff, trying to get a, a grasp of it. And of course, lots of people writing new interpretations of how all that uh, yeah. uh, happened as it goes. Um, but so the eternal, in this sense, as she explains, is forever. That's Plato's concept, right? So on the one hand, 
you know, the view that there's an eternal soul is the view that your soul basically lives forever in eternity, which is not a time structured momentary by momentary experience, but it's the idea that your soul exists for all, all time. So individuals that want to be eternal and the historical, uh, uh, the gods you know, that become eternal are not physically living as a body with no time. That's immortality. So the contrast she's making here is immortality is where you have long, incredibly long life. So Gandalf or Dumbledore, he's a, what, 150? You know, that's, you know, and his friend, shoot, I can't think of his name, but, Nicholas you know. Flamel. Dumbledore, Nicholas Flamel. Nicholas Flamel, he's 666 years old. Interesting number, right? Says uh, the book. And how, that's pretty dumb. You know, you get an old book that says he's 666 and it's still right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, there's a problem there, you know. Yeah. A phone book magic. about me from 1970 would not have my correct address, you know, no. or age, you know, etc. Right? <laughs> Howard, that's just silly. That's you pick apart movies like that, and they're just full of holes. Actually. Um, Makes me worry though, because you know you've got all these young kids that watch them, and accept them at face value without being critical thinkers and evaluating. Wait a minute, how can you do this? But there's something to be said because I'm one of those people that picks, picks everything apart. Ah. But now, wouldn't I maybe enjoy it more if I just enjoyed it for what it was? You know. Good I know. question. I I think there's two ways of enjoying it. The one is is letting right. yourself. What's the expression you? Tempor temporary uh, um, willingness to, to dis uh, disbelief. Oh, how does it go? I can't suspend remember. Suspend, suspend, suspending your disbelief yeah, so, so that you can enjoy it. Ah. So temporary suspension of disbelief. Right. I think that's the expression. So that you can enjoy the movie without picking it apart and saying, you know, you can't really have that many spider webs without some kind of energy, you know, you know, you know. You can't really go faster than light, you know, or, you know, or, yeah, you know, there's, you know, and you can't really have, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex or, or, you know, the King Kong climbing the building and, Pulling planes out of the air, you know. I, I mean, you can just mutilate. My dad is a mortician, and so whenever he watches movies of people like getting buried and stuff, like there's a big difference between a coffin and a casket, and he'll let you know they are not the same thing. Yeah. People often get confused in movies. <laughs> well, which ones are they that the individuals scratch? The, the coffins. The, those are the coffins. Coffin what gets nailed shut or sealed and a casket has a lid. Yeah, and coffins are shaped differently. Yeah. So they're more like this, Mummy. you know, like yeah. a vampire and it, caskets are what we use now I I've got a crucifix which is curved mm -hmm. that I've inherited from when my parents died. It was in their hope chest and no note about whose it was or whatever, but it's obviously made to go on uh, a curved. Oh, you know, on, orthodox, but yeah, that makes sense. Well, I can imagine it was on a coffin, the curved one, but they didn't bury it, so yeah. they took that off for whoever to, as a keepsake, and now I have it. But I don't even know whose it was, you yeah, know. So, so, <laughs> so that's kind of <laughs> plus flags, you know. The you know because tradition of being in the military. My grandfather was in World War One. My 
dad was in World War II. I don't know whose flag, you know, you know, they didn't bury my dad with military honors or anything, but they could have, we could have asked, but. Oh well. So the difference, this is actually pretty easy, is immortality is where you live forever. But physically living from second to second, continuing on. So basically really having a healthy life, living a long time. So those individuals that are concerned about living eternally in heaven are asking really for a very different thing than someone who wants immortality. Plus immortality can also result from like Plato still living immortally in our memories because of his works and statues of, of him and paintings representing him and so on. Um, so in a sense, Plato's <laughs> ideas continue immortally uh, because they still live, not in the biological sense obviously, but they still continue on uh, to influence more people today than ever. I mean, there are clearly maybe 50 people that were influenced by Plato in Athens when he lived. And I can't finish his books. Part. I can't finish his books. I'm trying, I'm trying to read the Republic forever. Oh, oh. I can't. Yeah. I can't. In fact, there's multiple translations. Oh, you can look at it, you know, in the Greek, on the Perseus Project. Whoa. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember um, I.F. Stone, I think it was, who was a retired journalist, famous already as, as a great journalist. Once he retired from being a journalist, he decided, okay, I'm going to learn Greek and read all the classics from the beginning. And then he wrote a book about the trial of Socrates and died. And so he only got through the apology. <laughs> so that's not, not as long a retirement as he thought he was going to have. You know. Eye of Stone, I think. That's a really good book, by the way. Um, I think it's I. F. Stone, uh, The Trial of Socrates. buy 196 copies of them for 10 cents a piece plus postage so 2.99 but they're still out there um, but it was interesting because it was a different take on it. you know if, if you think about all the scholars that have you know, worked on Plato analyzing Socrates and you read this one it's quite different of course we've got an even more interesting, more recent uh, version of it, uh, that's the Hemlock Cup. But th these are just, just a, two of, uh, there's probably a hundred books a year published on Socrates. That's crazy. Was it the Hemlock that killed him or did, did, did he end up getting it? He drank Hemlock. The, 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 the trial decided on capital punishment. He was to be killed. Their tradition was to kill him uh, by having him drink hemlock, and he drank the cup. Remember, I showed you Steve Martin's version of that. Yeah, yeah. for some reason I thought that like, it, it didn't work or something like that, and he ended up dying of other wounds. Uh, no, I think... Yeah, no, There's not. no doubt that he died no. as a result of the poison. Um, by the way, I have Stone is dead, and Bettany Hughes is alive and much sexier than I have Stone, at, in my you know, opinion. You know. So that, by the way, Bettany Hughes just friended me on Facebook. Yes, ah. I like Facebook. I don't. Find anything wrong with it. I don't know if it was really her, of course. Might have been some algorithm 
uh, that noticed Summer. that noticed that I've you know in my videos mentioned that she was very sexy, uh, and then you know who knows how I got how I got friended by Bet News. I don't know. However, she's making another BBC video, by the way. Uh -huh. So that's you know, so she's got her job. Right. Um, yeah, some of these folks are, are publishing so constantly that you could just spend your life reading their works. Are they bringing up anything new? I mean, if they're if they're really putting that many books on, on Socrates, like how much can you explore it before it's? I would say a dry well. I would say that our newer books on something from years ago are going to give us insights not only into the historical individual that they're describing, but enabling us to understand better what our own contemporary psychological, scientific, uh, uh, anthropological uh, uh, analyses enable today that weren't available in the past. So, so in a, a biography of David Yoon, or his own biography of himself, you know, his own life, he wrote a, his own biography. But other biographers writing about him that were contemporaries were biased uh, by yeah. knowing him and love, you know, loving him and all that sort of thing. But today, if we look at it, we're going to look at all sorts of insights that were certainly not even yeah. available to them. And so we're not just learning stuff about what he thought about his own life, or, or, or absolutely fascinating, Bertrand Russell, Ray Monk, uh, already years ago, wrote a two-volume biography of Bertrand Russell, who also wrote about himself. Uh, but one of the examples of, of this is that uh, Ray Monk, in, in looking at um, all of the information available so, so it's a two volume work right so you've got this volume eight, which goes 1872 to 1921 and then this one which is the second volume yep. 21 to 70 right so one of the things, for example, is you go through the internet, you find all of the letters that are available. They save letters. They wrote letters. He was married multiple times, I think five wives. And meanwhile, he also had quite a few other uh, women that he was <coughs> involved with intimately. Um, he believed in free love at the time. That was one of the things the bishops were mad at him for, by the way. Uh, uh, they, they denied his entrance to the United States at one point because he was a sinner. I know they could do that. Yeah, the bishops kind of encouraged the government to not allow him in, and they didn't. Although later on he did come uh -huh. in. And in fact, he had a ticker tape parade. Uh -huh. So that kind of showed the bishops what for, right? Um, but. He was very puzzled because he would lie to these women and he was puzzled at why his lies didn't work and that he'd get his way with them that he wanted because he thought he did such a good job lying to them in the letters. What Ray Monk uncovered was that these women all knew one another and were writing letters to one another. Uh -huh. And so they've got he's got letters that detail what he what the one woman said to the other about what he had lied to her, or he said to her, so that she find out that they're lies from the other one, right? So, so the women knew more of what he was thinking and doing mm -hmm. than they admitted to him, right? You know, so so basically, by reading this biography, you find out a lot more about what was going on in his life than he knew. <laughs> right so so that's yeah modern biography absolutely fascinating
you know, still, of course, it's a bias. It's looking at things from our, our contemporary bias, you know, about it. You know, so, so, you know, contemporary books are worth reading because it details stuff about them that we didn't know, plus more stuff about what it means to be human. What, what these fantastic people at their, in their time did, you know. And by the way, it's not just people like Bertrand Russell. Um, uh, here's here's a, a contemporary uh, um, author. Um, State. She is the current Alaska laureate, writer laureate this year. I don't know what when the anniversary changes and when we'll have a new laureate, but she's the current one as far as I know. Uh, the Tao of Raven is a biography of her experiences growing up in Juneau, uh, moving to California, uh, then coming back, becoming a student at UAS, and now she's a professor at UAS te teaching literature. Um, Where's that located? UAS. UAS. It's a multi-campus uh, uh, university. So we have the University of Alaska has three MAUs, which are main academic units. The one is UAA, University of Alaska Anchorage, which includes the main campus, Eagle River Campus, Matsu, Kenai, Homer, Homer, so Homer has a small, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Seward. Um, yeah, so, so all these little campuses, et cetera. And then UAS is headquartered, I think, in Juno, Sitka. Oh, okay. So no. Southeast. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. University of Alaska Southeast. Oh, and then there's APU. But APU I know that's is not its own. It's, I know it's its own entity. They're affiliated in the universe in the library because mm -hmm. the consort consortium. But those are the only three colleges we have in Alaska, right? No, oh, no. no there's no. also Wayland. Yeah, and also <laughs> Charter College. Um, plus, you can take courses online. I, I'm sure from all kinds of other folks. I think you can. I just did, I know there's not very uh, Phoenix many. University of Phoenix, which I wouldn't I wouldn't take any courses through them unless you were a graduate student taking a specific. Devry University is kind of a scam. You know what I'm talking about? I think it's called Devry. A lot of Devry, solely online colleges are not necessarily a scam, but they're exceedingly expensive, and then they also don't transfer They're for profit. They're for profit. Exactly, they're completely for profit. Um, and you can, a lot of the times your credits won't transfer if you decide to then go to a real university for like the last year or whatever. Uh -huh. So yeah. well, not all accreditation agencies are the same. And by the way, I personally believe that accreditation agencies are a scam. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, you know, universities feel obligated to be accredited so that they're they appear to be better mm -hmm. than those that are not accredited. Is there Plus, a it's it's a tie-in so that. Credits you get at an accredited university mm -hmm. will be accepted or more likely accepted at another university that has the same accreditation. So if you go, like if you go from here to APU, different accreditation, so, so it's not necessarily the case that your course will be accepted there. Yeah. So, but to a, a certain extent it's a scam because those agencies cost money, mm -hmm. and every so often they come in and they have their criteria that they use to evaluate, et cetera, and you have to pay enough in order to earn their accreditation, et cetera. 
What's is there like a number one college in the U.S.? Depends on what you're going for. But yeah, it depends on what you you want to study. I mean, yeah, I didn't know if there was like that. I mean, there are there are Ivy the Ivy schools, you know, et cetera. Uh, you yeah. could also study abroad. I've been thinking about doing that with UAA. You could also study a guy. You know. <laughs> A sexist joke, so that's. I should have given you a trigger warning. Sexist wow. joke about to come. <laughs> you know, ha uh -huh. But the truth is, once you pass <laughs> Ivy League schools, your college doesn't really matter. Yeah. Get your degree. That's what I figured. You're actually, in some ways, I would bet better off coming from Alaska, applying to a university in Europe where they speak in English or a language that you could pick, you could, learning another language, mon dieu, you know, that's. I'm in ASL right now and I really like it. I, that's American Sign Language though. I don't know I how know. useful that will be in. Yeah, in, in, in I know, but it's another language is what I, my thing, you know, it's, it's what I was thinking. <laughs> However, However, I bet you know a lot of universities would love to have an applicant from a place like Alaska because yeah. you know most cool. you know an awful lot of people won't apply because oh I won't be. Never but, you know, but guess yeah. what? You know they're they're like hungry for weird and unusual people. Yeah, they are. The international university exchange. Yeah, I did the national student. A lot of a lot of them have funding, oh, like, like crazy. So they money. they won't even need money from you if you know you're interesting enough to them. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know, they'll they'll take you. Uh, yeah, that's not hard. Yeah. To I broaden their their student, uh, um, you know, population, to include someone from somewhere. Same thing with public publishing from Alaska. A lot of publishers are really interested in Alaskan authors because people in the lower 48 are amazed that you know you can type in an igloo. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you don't even have electricity up there, do you? you know? I was watching The Price is Right this morning for whatever reason it was just on, and one of the one of the awards was a trip to Fairbanks, Alaska, and everyone like the contestants were like. Like, I know that a lot of people in the North 48 think it's like amazing to come here, but it was a trip to Fairbanks, Alaska, yeah. and you got to go to Chena Hot Springs or something, and I was like, oh, what a trip. Yeah. I'll know. Or McKinley, what are they calling it now? Is it McKinley or Denali? I think it's... The official federal name for it is Denali now. Okay. I knew, yeah. The, one I did. the people in Ohio who are upset because their, their home, McKinley, you know, I, I mean, McKinley was one of their state, uh, you know. Uh, sons. Son, son yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it was named in honor of McKinley. Yeah. And, and, you know, but Denali is now the, I think Obama did that, so. Yeah, well, so I think Trump, that's probably one of the things on his list of oh, things okay. to screw up, that's you know. That's, that's what we need, yeah. Make McKinley great again. <laughs> what a, I love our life, I'll tell you. It's amazingly interesting. I'm still not sure if we're at war with Russia right now or not, because, you know, we've got, the missiles will be coming, you know, and there'll be smart missiles. The Russian ambassador said, "If they're so smart that they sh they should attack the rebels." <laughs> Sorry. So here's a biography. It's absolutely fascinating about a living person that lives here. Is I think she's 66, 65, something like that. Fascinating. I've met her. I mean, this is. Absolutely fascinating. So, so yeah. By current biographies, will she live immortally in the memory of her readers? Like, you 
know, the person that wrote about the bunnies. What's her name? Oh gosh, I've, my wife has all Marcia her books. Uh, we've, we've got lots of books about Peter Peter Rabbit or uh, Cotton, you know, Cotton whatever her name was. You know, we've got tons of those books, etc. Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. Always going to have William Shakespeare, Plato at least, Immor Immortals, the Immortals. Uh, what's the quiz question? So I, I asked this last class and I, it's fascinating to me, so I'll ask it here too to see uh, what you guys think. And that is, uh, is Facebook obligated to protect everyone's privacy better than they have so far? Um, it might not be the best way to ask that. Um, you know, so, so what are your thoughts about the current situation, I guess? I have very little about it. Like, you get little notifications and oh. someone moved your info. Oh. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Well, Mark Zuckerberg. I, he's apologizing to Congress or whatever, right? He's explained to Congress what it's it's a dog and pony show. They're just trying to make it look like they're doing something. Almost every person on that congressional panel has been has received money from Facebook for uh, campaign funding. So how how you know incentivized are they to Jesus? God, that would be. Is an idealistic and optimistic company. For most of our existence, we focused on all of the good that connecting people can do. And as Facebook has grown, people everywhere have gotten a powerful new tool. So, what are your thoughts on the current situation? Because for making their voices what precipitated for this was the uh, Cambridge Analytica these tools from being used for the foreign, as well. and that goes for foreign company. News. British, that harvested information well from several apps that we were didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility available through and Facebook. Was mistake. And it was my mistake. And then that and information was used in order to I started Facebook. try to influence I it, people I'm responsible for what happens here. with regard to it's their voting, etc. We have to make sure that those Notice this was not the Russian it's not thing. enough to just give people a voice. We need to make these sure are all these folks are out there trying to influence you to vote this way, buy this way, think this way. We need to make sure Everybody's competing. For, I'm competing for your interest to get you to think to work all the philosophically but I'm and take more of my courses. <laughs> We're all competing. 